Lesson 13 A Step in Faith Sabbath Afternoon September 19 When we study the divine character in the light of the cross, we see mercy, tenderness, and forgiveness blended with equity and justice. We see in the midst of the throne, one bearing in hands and feet and side, the marks of the suffering endured to reconcile man to God. We see a Father, infinite, dwelling in light unapproachable, yet receiving us to Himself through the merits of His Son. In the contemplation of Christ, we linger on the shore of a love that is measureless. We endeavor to tell of this love and language fails us. We consider his life on earth, his sacrifice for us, his work in heaven as our advocate, and the mansions he is preparing for those who love him, and we can only exclaim, Oh, the height and depth of the love of Christ! In every true disciple, this love, like sacred fire, burns on the altar of the heart. It was on the earth that the love of God was revealed through Christ. It is on the earth that his children are to reflect this love through blameless lives. Thus sinners will be led to the cross to behold the Lamb of God. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 333 and 334. Christ was not insensible to ignominy and disgrace. He felt it all most bitterly. He felt it as much more deeply and acutely than we can feel suffering as his nature was more exalted and pure and holy than that of the sinful race for whom he suffered. He was the majesty of heaven. He was equal with the Father. He was the commander of the hosts of angels. Yet he died for man the death that was, above all others, clothed with ignominy and reproach. Oh, that the haughty hearts of men might realize this! Oh, that they might enter into the meaning of redemption and seek to learn the meekness and lowliness of Jesus! That I may know him, page 339. In this life, we can only begin to understand the wonderful theme of redemption. With our finite comprehension, we may consider most earnestly the shame and the glory, the life and the death, the justice and the mercy that meet in the cross. Yet with the utmost stretch of our mental powers, we fail to grasp its full significance. The length and breadth, the depth and the height of redeeming love are but dimly comprehended. The plan of redemption will not be fully understood even when the ransomed see as they are seen and know as they are known. But through the eternal ages, new truth will continually unfold to the wondering and delighted mind. Though the griefs and pains and temptations of earth are ended and the cause removed, the people of God will ever have a distinct, intelligent knowledge of what their salvation has cost. The cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. The Great Controversy, page 651. Sunday, September 20. Jesus' Self-Sacrificing Love The humiliation of the man Christ Jesus is incomprehensible to the human mind but his divinity and his existence before the world was formed can never be doubted by those who believe the word of God. The Apostle Paul speaks of our Mediator, the only begotten Son of God, who in a state of glory was in the form of God, the commander of all the heavenly hosts, and who, when he clothed his divinity with humanity, took upon him the form of a servant. In consenting to become man, Christ manifested a humility that is the marvel of the heavenly intelligences. The act of consenting to be a man would be no humiliation were it not for the fact of Christ's exalted pre-existence. We must open our understanding to realize that Christ laid aside his royal robe, his kingly crown, his high command, and clothed his divinity with humanity that he might meet man where he was and bring to the human family moral power to become the sons and daughters of God. 
To redeem man, Christ became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 243 and 244. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. This is the grand and heavenly theme that has in a large degree been left out of the discourses because Christ is not formed within the human mind. And Satan has had his way that it shall be thus, that Christ should not be the theme of contemplation and adoration. This name, so powerful, so essential, should be on every tongue. Selected Messages, Book 3, pages 184 and 185. Christ was himself without spot or stain of sin, but having taken the nature of man, he was exposed to the fiercest assaults of the enemy, to his sharpest temptations, to the keenest of sorrow. He suffered being tempted. He was made like unto his brethren, that he might show that through the grace given, humanity could overcome the temptations of the enemy. Listen to his words. Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8. In Heavenly Places, page 41. Monday, September 21. Commitments Call When Christ called his disciples to follow him, he offered them no flattering prospects in this life. He gave them no promise of gain or worldly honor, nor did they make any stipulation as to what they should receive. To Matthew, as he sat at the receipt of custom, the Savior said, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Matthew did not before rendering service wait to demand a certain salary equal to the amount received in his former occupation. Without question or hesitation, he followed Jesus. It was enough for him that he was to be with the Savior, that he might hear his words and unite with him in his work. So it was with the disciples previously called. When Jesus bade Peter and his companions follow him, they immediately left their boats and nets. Some of these disciples had friends dependent on them for support. But when they received the Savior's invitation, they did not hesitate, inquiring, How shall I live and sustain my family? They were obedient to the call. And when afterward Jesus asked them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lack ye anything? They could answer, Nothing. Luke chapter 22, verse 35. Gospel Workers, pages 113 and 114. Many are unable to make definite plans for the future. Their life is unsettled. They cannot discern the outcome of affairs, and this often fills them with anxiety and unrest. Let us remember that the life of God's children in this world is a pilgrim life. We have not wisdom to plan our own lives. It is not for us to shape our future. Christ in his life on earth made no plans for himself. He accepted God's plans for him, and day by day the Father unfolded his plans. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. As we commit our ways to him, he will direct our steps. Too many in planning for a brilliant future make an utter failure. Let God plan for you. As a little child, trust to the guidance of him who will keep the feet of his saints. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. The Ministry of Healing, pages 478 and 479. The first thing to be learned by all who would become workers together with God is the lesson of self-distrust. 
then they are prepared to have imparted to them the character of Christ. This is not to be gained through education in the most scientific schools. It is the fruit of wisdom that is obtained from the divine teacher alone. The Desire of Ages, page 249 Tuesday, September 22 Paul, God's Chosen Vessel very earnest and touching is Paul's appeal that his Corinthian brethren consider anew the matchless love of their Redeemer. Ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, he wrote, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You know the height from which he stooped, the depth of humiliation to which he descended, Having once entered upon the path of self-denial and sacrifice, he turned not aside until he had given his life. There was no rest for him between the throne and the cross. Point after point Paul lingered over, in order that those who should read his epistle might fully comprehend the wonderful condescension of the Savior in their behalf. Presenting Christ as he was when equal with God and with him receiving the homage of the angels, the apostle traced his course until he had reached the lowest depths of humiliation. Paul was convinced that if they could be brought to comprehend the amazing sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven, all selfishness would be banished from their lives. He showed how the Son of God had laid aside his glory, voluntarily subjecting himself to the conditions of human nature, and then had humbled himself as a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, that he might lift fallen man from degradation to hope and joy and heaven. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 332 and 333. Paul's heart burned with a love for sinners, and he put all his energies into the work of soul winning. There never lived a more self-denying, persevering worker. The blessings he received, he prized as so many advantages to be used in blessing others. He lost no opportunity of speaking of the Savior or of helping those in trouble. From place to place he went, preaching the gospel of Christ and establishing churches. Wherever he could find a hearing, he sought to counteract wrong and to turn the feet of men and women into the path of righteousness. The Acts of the Apostles, page 367 Always the Lord gives the human agent his work. Here is the divine and the human cooperation. There is the man working in obedience to divine light given. If Saul had said, Lord, I am not at all inclined to follow your specified directions to work out my own salvation. Then should the Lord have let ten times the light shine upon Saul, it would have been useless. It is man's work to cooperate with the divine, and it is the very hardest, sternest conflict which comes with the purpose and hour of great resolve and decision of the human to incline the will and way to God's will and God's way, relying upon the gracious influences which accompanied him all his life long. The doing is not in accordance with the feeling or the inclination, but with the known will of our Father which is in heaven. Follow and obey the leadings of the Holy Spirit. Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 757. Wednesday, September 23. The Demands of Love The love of Christ, said Paul, constraineth us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. This was the actuating principle of his conduct. It was his motive power. If ever his ardor in the path of duty flagged for a moment, one glance at the cross caused him to gird up anew the loins of his mind and press forward in the way of self-denial. In his labors for his brethren, he relied much upon the manifestation of infinite love in the sacrifice of Christ with its subduing, constraining power. The Ministry of Healing, page 500. Three times Peter had openly denied his Lord, and three times Jesus drew from him the assurance of his love and loyalty, pressing home that pointed question like a barbed arrow to his wounded heart. 
Before the assembled disciples, Jesus revealed the depth of Peter's repentance and showed how thoroughly humbled was the once boasting disciple. Peter was naturally forward and impulsive, and Satan had taken advantage of these characteristics to overthrow him. Just before the fall of Peter, Jesus had said to him, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. That time had now come, and the transformation in Peter was evident. The close testing questions of the Lord had not called out one forward, self-sufficient reply, and because of his humiliation and repentance, Peter was better prepared than ever before to act as shepherd to the flock. The Desire of Ages, page 812. This heart-searching question was necessary in the case of Peter, and it is necessary in our case. The work of restoration can never be thorough unless the roots of evil are reached. Again and again the shoots have been clipped, while the root of bitterness has been left to spring up and defile many. But the very depth of the hidden evil must be reached. This is the work before every soul who has dishonored God and grieved the heart of Christ by a denial of truth and righteousness. If the tempted soul endures the trying process and self does not awake to life to feel hurt and abused under the test, that probing knife reveals that the soul is indeed dead to self, but alive unto God. Conflict and Courage, page 322. The first work that Christ entrusted to Peter on restoring him to the ministry was to feed the lambs. This was a work in which Peter had little experience. It would require great care and tenderness, much patience and perseverance. It called him to minister to those who were young in the faith, to teach the ignorant, to open the scriptures to them, and to educate them for usefulness in Christ's service. Heretofore, Peter had not been fitted to do this, or even to understand its importance. But this was the work which Jesus now called upon him to do. For this work his own experience of suffering and repentance had prepared him. The Desire of Ages, page 812. Thursday, September 24. Love's Commitment that he might be strengthened for the final test of his faith, the Savior opened to Peter his future. He told him that after living a life of usefulness, when age was telling upon his strength, he would indeed follow his Lord. Jesus said, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Jesus thus made known to Peter the very manner of his death. He even foretold the stretching forth of his hands upon the cross. Again he bade his disciple, Follow me. Peter was not disheartened by the revelation. He felt willing to suffer any death for his Lord. He had loved him as a man, as a heaven-sent teacher. He now loved him as God. He had been learning the lesson that to him Christ was all in all. Now he was prepared to share in his Lord's mission of sacrifice. When at last brought to the cross, he was, at his own request, crucified with his head downward. He thought it too great an honor to suffer in the same way as his master did. The Desire of Ages, pages 815 and 816. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, when the disciples went forth to proclaim a living Savior, their one desire was the salvation of souls. They rejoiced in the sweetness of communion with saints. They were tender, thoughtful, self-denying, willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. In their daily association with one another, they revealed the love that Christ had enjoined upon them. By unselfish words and deeds, they strove to kindle this love in other hearts. Such a love the believers were ever to cherish, 
they were to go forward in willing obedience to the new commandment. So closely were they to be united with Christ that they would be enabled to fulfill all his requirements. Their lives were to magnify the power of a Savior who could justify them by his righteousness. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 547 and 548. Divine love makes its most touching appeals to the heart when it calls upon us to manifest the same tender compassion that Christ manifested. That man only who has unselfish love for his brother has true love for God. Those who have never experienced the tender, winning love of Christ cannot lead others to the fountain of life. His love in the heart is a constraining power which leads men to reveal him in the conversation, in the tender, pitiful spirit, in the uplifting of the lives of those with whom they associate. Christian workers who succeed in their efforts must know Christ, and in order to know him, they must know his love. In heaven, their fitness as workers is measured by their ability to love as Christ loved and to work as he worked. The Acts of the Apostles, page 550. For further reading, that I may know him, will you let him in, page 56, and, in heavenly places, glory indescribable, page 358.